All right, good morning. This is my certified culinary educator demonstration video. My name is Chef Jason Abelson. I'm with the Culinary School of Fort Worth. Uh, today's class we're going to be covering is knife skills and fabrication review. And the next class following this one will be meat cookery. All right, so in, in any demonstration, one thing you want to make sure of is that you get your station set up correctly. So first and foremost, I just want to take a few moments to show you. We have our sanitizer that's already been tested with our test strips between 50 and 100%, 100 parts per million. Over here we have our detergent. We'll keep those under our station. No need to clutter our top. But what we are going to do before we do anything else is grab our sanitizer rag and just give the station a good once over, right? You want to believe that the last shift cleaned it perfectly, but the only way to make sure that you're nice and sanitary is to wipe down your station before you begin. Okay, nice, clean, sanitary surface. All right. Now, a couple other things that we can't see that are under here are uh, our, our refuse containers. So we have food refuse and non-food refuse. Uh, the reason we do that is because here at the Corner School of Fort Worth, and really as a principal of any kitchen and operation, uh, we use some of our scraps to go into stocks and other, other dishes, and we also use our, our food refuse. A lot of our plant refuse goes to compost at the local area food bank's garden. So uh, we, we compost that every day and take it down there. All right, so just continuing the station setup, a uh, couple things we're going to do here. We're setting up for kitchen, uh, chicken fabrication, okay? Uh, gloves, disposable rags, our knife kit, okay, what we're going to be using for today. Now, I want to show you what we've got here, and then I'm going to move it down below because, again, there's no reason to have it on your top. So we have our small peering knife for making the small cuts like the wishbone. We have our bony knife, which we'll be using primarily, and, of course, our chef's knife your multi-purpose knife for everything else you need to do in the kitchen. All right. All right, cutting boards. So, if you haven't seen them before, colored cutting boards. They, they ensure that you are using the correct cutting board for the correct application. So, yellow cutting board for poultry ensures that each and every time this is used, um, when I use it and whoever uses it after me, we know that it's used for poultry. Just one continued defense against cross-contamination, okay? And our board set up, when we put down this napkin a little bit damp, what we're preventing is, is that when you have your cutting board on, on a stainless steel surface like this, it tends to slip, right? But we don't want that. We want a nice, non-slip cutting surface, okay? So, whenever we're working with poultry, we're trying to be careful with pathogens and bacteria and ensure that we don't get those juices anywhere, that we, we act in a sanitary fashion in each way that we handle it. Uh, really quickly, Max, what is the bacteria that, that we're trying to stay clean from? What is that called? Uh, salmonella. Chef. Salmonella, absolutely. So one thing we know for sure that will get people sick is salmonella, so uh, we want to avoid any cross-contamination uh, and want to stay sanitized at all times. The chicken I'm going to be using is something we ordered through our bulk ordering guide that's called a wog. That's a chicken without guts. So we won't be pulling out any Thanksgiving surprises here. I'm going to go ahead and grab and bring my bony knife up because that's the knife I'll be using really quickly. You'll notice is that what I'm using up here stays up here and that my clean and sanitary equipment either stays below me or on my rack. There won't be any, anything up here that I'm not using. Okay. All right, so grabbing our wog. If you didn't see me reach all the way down there, um, even on my rack, I want to maintain proper food storage. So up here I have my vegetables. Just below that I have my terrace major or my beef, which I'll be using here shortly. And then on the very bottom where I grabbed this was my chicken, right? We don't want to have any cross-contamination where the chicken can drip down onto anything else, right? Because chicken is cooked to the highest temperature, right? So you can always ensure that that's always cooked out. All right, we're gonna move our wog to the cutting board, and then what we're gonna do is, we're gonna move this up front to hold our chicken parts. You'll notice that we have ice in here, right? So the reason we have ice is because time temperature abuse, right? We want to make sure that we are keeping our chicken nice and cold, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move it just to the right, just a little bit so we can see the chicken. First and foremost, before we even cut into it, we want to take one of our disposable rags, okay, and we want to really pat the chicken down dry, okay? Get rid of any of that, uh, you know, sort of moisture that happened while it was in storage, any of the, the continued that happened after, 
And you even want to kind of just reach in this cavity, give it a quick little tuck, because all that will leak out while you're moving the chicken around. Uh, taking this, put it into our non-food refuse, okay, and then we'll get started. All right, anatomy of a chicken. If you understand the anatomy of a chicken, sometimes it's much easier to understand the goal of where you're trying to go. So we have the legs and the thighs down here, wings, arms here like a chicken, and then we have the breasts, okay? So first and foremost, the first cut we're gonna make is right here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna very deliberately choose where we cut here, okay? We wanna choose a little bit closer to the leg because what we wanna do is we're gonna turn these into skin on airline breasts for tomorrow's class. Okay, and so because we want the skin on the breast, we're going to cut a little bit closer to the thigh here. Okay, there we go. We'll make the same incision over here. And there we go. Okay, you'll notice that just with a, with a lot, slight bit of pressure, right, very sharp knife, uh, being safe with a knife it isn't, is, is not only about holding it correctly, it's additionally about ensuring that you are you have a sharp knife because a dull knife tends to be an unsafe knife. Okay, so right in here, what we're going to do is on the back side is this oyster. Okay, and, and in the French, they call this uh, solely less. And what that means is uh, only an idiot would leave this behind because it's a very tender cut of meat. So, what I'm going to do with my knife is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to go right into that cavity to cut out that oyster. Okay, and then right along the bottom here, all the way out until we have our first quarter okay putting that on ice right away and we're simply going to do the same thing on the other side lifting up letting the gravity of the chicken cut down looking for that oyster right here on the back cutting in with the oyster and then out through the quarter okay we now have our two quarters all right flipping it over now we have a little bit of maintenance work to do okay first thing we want to do is go ahead and cut off our wing tips okay Great for stocks. Definitely want to get all of the chicken bone flavor you can get in your stocks. So the wing tips are great for that and they'll go along with our carcass in that manner. Okay, next we have our arms and these arms are broken into two segments just like a human arm. So up here we have our beefy shoulder which we call our drum and out here we have our wing flat which is essentially the forearm. Okay, so what we're going to do is here we're just going to cut the skin ever so slightly just enough to expose the tendon. Okay. And we're just gonna find that spot right in the middle and cut down, okay? And there's our first wing flat. Doing the same thing on the other side. Cutting down with the chicken, finding where the, t where the cartilage is and cutting down. All right. So now we have left on the carcass are our two breasts and our two drums, okay? So what we're gonna do is here, right along the top here is the keel bone. So we're gonna cut right along the top here, right along that breastbone. And what I usually do is I'll feel for where the bone's at and figure out which side I landed on, okay? And then just continue working with that side, okay? So. We're just gonna keep cutting down the rib cage here, okay? Right. Last cut here at the bottom is right where that knuckle's at, right? Because we left that shoulder on there. We want to make sure we have a nice head, nice stand-up airline breast. You're just going to come right under here, right under that shoulder knuckle, okay? And cut all the way through, okay? And then we have a nice airline breast. One thing we want to take off the bottom here, just because it kind of takes away from it a little bit, are our tenders, okay? Put our airline breast in there, all right? And then come back on the other side and do the same thing. Okay, right along the rib cage, all the way down. All right, just making sure we get under that knuckle. And again, another airline press with skin on. Okay, all right, so what are we gonna do with this carcass? We have a little bit of meat left on the carcass. We can definitely see right up against the rib cage here. Um, what we're going to do is, is we're going to prepare this for stock. Okay, and what I want to do is I'm going to take my gloves off really quickly because what I want to do is put these in my non-food refuge and reach down here and grab my chef's knife. And why am I doing that? Because a little more heavier, a little more heavier tang, 
and should enable us to cut through the carcass a little bit easier. Uh, and we do want to cut through that. Why? Because inside of those bones, inside of the rib cage and all that is all that delicious marrow and fat and chicken flavor. And so we just want to make sure we incorporate all of that. Okay? So, get some new set of gloves on. All right, taking our chef's knife right along the back here. We're just gonna cut right down the middle. Once we have a nice incision, just push down, okay? And then just as you can see there, all the cartilage opened up. That, that's gonna be great for our stock. We'll put that right on top of our wing tips. All right, so we fabricated our chicken. Josh, if I'm in a hurry, right, and I, I really just wanna get this cooked, can I just, uh, can I just wipe, wipe down my station and just keep going to the next task? No, Chef, you need to clean and then sanitize your whole station. Absolutely, point. absolutely. So, what we're going to do is, we're gonna bring back our lid from down here. We saw our chicken on ice before we take it to the region. And we're gonna put that back on for storage for later. Now, really quickly, while I'm cleaning up, what I wanna talk about is how you should clean up, okay? So again, using these disposable napkins to get some of the debris off of your knives, okay? Some of those chicken debris, okay? And then just giving your cutting board just a quick once over, just trying to get all that excess juice and bits up. And this is just called cleaning. This is just cleaning. Uh, the difference, what we wanna make a distinguish about here is that cleaning is to remove debris from the surface, right? But to sanitize is to remove any of the pathogens or bacteria that may still be around after the fact. All right, so really quickly before I move on, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sanitize both of my knives, okay? And move those down to my sanitary area. And while I'm wiping down this table and the cutting board, I want to talk about what you're going to do with the chicken we just fabricated tomorrow. So, you have two breasts, okay? And tomorrow you will be doing one sear and one grill on those breasts. Okay, make sure you're writing this down so that you're prepared for tomorrow's class. Okay, your two wing flats will be deep fried. Your two legs will be roasted. And just move this down below here. And your, your two legs will be roasted and your two thighs will be braised, okay? And when we talk about why we cook the different parts of the chicken in different ways, what we're really referring to is that, that muscle inside the chicken, right? Why, why would we cook a breast different than we cook a leg, right? And it's just that, that, that leg does most of the work, right? And the breast tends to be that tender whitening. So how you prepare them in the kitchen tends to be different based on how the muscle is used on the animal, okay? So now that we've got a nice, clean, sanitized station, okay? Um, what I wanna do really quickly is wash my hands before I put on the next set of gloves, okay? So I'm gonna go step offline really quick, wash my hands, and we'll be right back to do the beef portion. All right, back from washing our hands, and now we wanna get our station set again. So we got a nice, clean, sanitary station, grabbing one of our disposable wipes, grabbing some of our, a little bit of our sanitizer water down here. All right, so what do we have next? Beef fabrication, okay? So, again, laying out our paper towel, grabbing our red cutting board, because we're cutting raw meats, red meats, okay? Again, just a, just a defense against cross-contamination. If, if I clean and sanitize that board, you know, it's, a, it's clean and sanitary, and technically it could be multi-purpose, but um, we're just trying to keep as many barriers against cross-contamination up as we can. All right, so just above my chicken on my storage here is my Terrace Major, okay? I'm gonna grab my bone knife down here for my sanitary knife tray, okay? All right. Move that to our cutting board. Same process as before. Go back and grab the claw, okay? Just want a nice dry butcher surface, okay? 
get all that excess liquid off of there, and then put that in our in our refuge. Okay. All right. So, what are we looking to trim off of here? First of all, what is a terrace major? Let's, let's identify that really quickly. Okay. So the terrace major is what we call the hidden fillet on a cow. It has that same tenderness that you get from the tenderloin, but often overlooked. Um, very tender cut, just like filet mignon. Um, and and the, what you're trying to identify here is the silver skin you can see here on top, okay, and these additional fat lines. What we want to do is just trim some of that away as a way of butchering it. Um, right here on the side, what we're going to do is, is we're going to take the, the edge of our knife and just slide it just under that silver skin to create a pocket, okay, and then cut away. You'll notice that I'll keep all of my beef scraps right here on the end until I'm done, and I'll show you why, okay, but again, just working our way through the meat, just trying to cut off any additional silver skin and fat. Okay. Another piece right here. Also, you'll notice when I'm removing things from my knife, I, I don't go like this, right? I don't ever expose my hand to the blade of the knife. And that just goes back to knife safety, right? Um, we can remove it the same way by pushing away from the blade. And so just training your hands and training your movements around the station to ensure you don't put your hands in danger. It's just something you always want to stay focused on as a culinarian. Okay. We're going to do a little bit more here. Okay. Flipping it to the other side. We have a little excess fat on the end here. And since we're already butchering scraps, we're just going to go ahead and take that off. Come in here. You'll notice I'm making nice, gentle strokes. And what I do is, is when I'm under the silver skin, I'm not, I'm not curving the blade down. Right? I'm not trying to cut into the meat. What I'm trying to do is tip the blade just a little bit up so that it tries to cut back towards the silver skin and not into the cut, right? And another thing you'll notice is, watch when I make this cut here, it's nice and smooth, okay? But also I'm deliberately completing each motion, okay? So I, you won't see me in here sawing, right? Which will create jagged marks in the meat. What I'm doing is one nice, consistent, smooth cut so that what you get is a nice, consistent, smooth grain in the butcher. Uh, to come in here and get some of this trimmed off of here. So we got a big pocket of fat here. All right. All right. So one thing we want to be aware of as we're taking this off is, yes, we want to remove the silver skin. Yes, we want to remove the fat. But when we're done, we also want to have a nice round loin to be able to cut our medallions from. Okay. So coming back in here, we got a couple more we want to get out. Okay. Now, if you talk to most butchers, especially most culinarians that have been in the kitchen, as picky as you want to be, as, as attention to detail, as perfection as you want to be, you could continue to go through here and try to get every tiny little bit of silver skin off of here, every little tiny bit of grains, fat, extra. Um, what you really want to do is get those really disturbing pockets out of there so that you can get a nice, good fillet out of it. Okay? So I'm going to grab one of my disposables really quickly. Okay? What I want to do is I just want to get these, there's a scrap there, and I want to get, get these bits off my knife before we go in and make our medallions. Now, when choosing how to cut your medallions, you want to be thinking about your portions, okay? So we already know that if we want nice, even portions for this filet, these two tips are not going to be even portions, right? By their very nature, they're going to be skinny up to that point. So what we want to do is look across our meat here and decide right about here, is where it's a nice even all the way across. Okay, so what we're gonna do is come in with our knife, nice quick cut, okay? Set our tip over there, come back, find that same point over here, nice quick cut, okay? And there are two tips, and we'll talk about those in just a few seconds. Now, here's our nice even squared off and butchered filet, okay? Now, I've already decided that for tomorrow's class we're going to do three medallions, okay? So you'll sear those medallions and then you'll butter base them. So what I wanna do is, I wanna look visually and decide where I think one third of this meat is, okay? Now, if I've been lucky, a little quick cut there, I can take that and put it right here, 
make one more cut, and hopefully we have three nice even medallions, okay? So, what are we going to do with our tips? Well, in meat cookery, you're going to be taught by Chef G on how to use the meat grinder, okay? So what we're going to do is we're just going to come in, cut these into manageable chunks, and then tomorrow all of us will put our tips together and use them for meat grind. All right, so really quickly, just want to grab our beef storage, okay? So before we grab, this is for our scraps and our terrace major, okay? Now, you'll notice on my containers, before I even move them into the walk-in, I've already done my mise en place, right? What does mise en place mean? Everything in its place. So I've already put my labels, right, which have what the ingredient is, my name, the date, the time that I put it in there, and when it should be used by. Why do I do that in advance? Because again, you should be preparing for everything you need to do on station. So you go through all of your tasks, put everything away, clean up, and move on to the next task. Okay, so I have two here. One is for my Terrace Major medallions for tomorrow, so we'll put those in there. Okay? Then we will put our scraps in here for our grind. Now, you're probably asking yourself, Chef, what are we going to do with this remaining scrap? What can we do to use this? And in the kitchen, you'll find the most common use for these leftover scraps is either A, put it into beef fat and use it for tallow, or B, you can actually throw this into your beef stock along with your roasted bones and mirepoix and get a little more beef flavor into that beef stock by using these scraps, okay? Um, you just want to be careful that you, you do strain it properly because you never want to see this in the finished product, okay? So, we are going to put this in our food refuse, okay? And really quickly, if you guys haven't noticed already, I have everything on ice over here. So when I take these two, and we're going to move these over to the region, but before I do, I have a container of ice. And we just want to keep that meat on ice until we move it to the region, right? Time temperature abuse, we want to keep it out of that temperature danger zone, which is again 41 to 135. All right, we're going to get the chunks off our knife, wipe down our cutting board. Just want to get any ancillary, any debris off of here so that we're able to safely sanitize. Okay, put that into our non-food refuge, grab our sanitizer rag. All right, really quickly before we move across, we'll go ahead and sanitize our bony knife again. Okay, and then move that down to our sanitary tray. Wipe down our cutting board. Napkin goes into our non-food refuse and clean it up. All right. All right, and before we move on to the next text, again, I'm gonna go wash my hands. All right, and we're back from washing our hands. Time to move on to our vegetable prep for tomorrow. All right, so we have our nice clean sanitary station. We're gonna grab one of our disposable towels again, and we're gonna grab some of that sanitizer water, okay? Nice and damp, squeeze it out, move it up top. All right, so the green cutting board for vegetables. Now we've ensured by using colored cutting boards that if we use the, are you okay, sir? Just making yeah. sure. Okay. Uh, so when we use the green cutting boards, what we do is create, again, another barrier. We can be ensured that we've only used vegetables here, so this has never seen chicken. This has never seen beef or pork or whatever else. Uh, again, just another barrier to cross-contamination. Okay, so vegetable prep, okay? So I have all my vegetables here together in the tin. Again, labeled properly with our name. I'm gonna go ahead and peel that top off and move that back. And really quickly, I just wanna go over what we have in here. So we have some carrots, celery, red bell pepper, onion, garlic, jalapeno, and some basil, okay? So I'm gonna move that off to the right here, okay? Now, one clarification I want to make is that everything that I'm going to be cutting in today's prep is going to be cooked in tomorrow's class. So nothing I have in here is considered ready to eat. 
Why is that important? Because if we know we're going to cook it and therefore cook any you know, pathogens that could be on our hands, then we don't need to glove up while we're cutting up these vegetables. All right, so I'm gonna bring my multi-purpose knife or my chef's knife back up top, and we're gonna begin our prep. So first and foremost, what do we have on the list here? We are going to do onions, okay? Already labeled for use. Really important to remember when, you, when you're cutting any vegetables that if they do roll, okay, that you wanna get it to a point where you have it on a flat surface. Okay, so first and foremost, we're just gonna cut right along the end here. Now watch my hands. You'll notice that at no point in time are my hands anywhere near where I cut, right? My fingers act like a, like a guard. This is called the claw, okay? Now that I've made that incision, I can go ahead and roll it on 10, right? Now it doesn't roll. Scraps into our, our food refuge, right? We wanna send that to the compost bin, all right? And then we're gonna cut right down the middle here, okay? Now that we've got up the middle, I think I'm gonna go ahead and move my, my non-food refuge up here, or my food refuge, rather, okay? so that we can put our scraps straight across. All right, so we wanna peel this outer layer off of these onions, right? Um, if left on, sometimes they can create kind of a bitter taste. And, and generically speaking, they have most of the dirt from being you know, on or near, on in or near the ground on them. So we wanna go ahead and get that off. All right, got that outer layer off. Now, how do we cut an onion to achieve what we're trying to get done? Okay, so our first dice here is going to be a small dice onion. Okay, so the onion you'll notice has natural lines. Okay, we can use those to our advantage as culinarians. So what we're gonna do first is, using our hand and staying away, we're gonna make one incision right along the bottom here, keeping our knife parallel to the bottom. Okay, try to get to about three quarters or a little bit further in and pull it back out. One more up top three quarters in the middle or pull it back out. And now we have our horizontal lines that are gonna be working with our vertical lines. Okay, now, again, I can't cut my fingers, even if I'm talking to you, even if I'm talking to a student, even if I'm talking to my chef. As long as I'm protecting my fingers with the claw, I can make cuts without looking because I'm acting safely with the knife. Okay, the grip, three fingers on the handle, two on the blade, and we're just making light incisions, down and away, down and away, okay? Now, we have all of our dimensions built in. We have the natural lines of the onion, our lines across the top and our horizontal cuts. Now we'll be able to come back and just cut right along the top here. Okay, and our result, nice small diced onions, okay? All right, so what are we gonna use the small diced onions for? Tomorrow we'll be making rice pilaf. So you'll take these small diced onions, put them into your pan with a little bit of fat, and just get them to where they're nice and translucent, translucent before you add your rice tomorrow, okay? All right, and there's our small dice. It is a cut vegetable, Okay, so what, what I'm going to do is push this over, and what I'm going to do is go ahead and put this into my ice cream, okay, nice and cool, because it is a cut vegetable. Okay, this can be used for our stock presentation here in a few moments. Now, we have one other cut we want to get with our onion. Okay, the first one was a small dice. Okay, the dimensions on small dice are one quarter by one quarter <clears throat> by one quarter. Okay, but this one we want to do large dice. So let's see, mm, James, what are the dimensions of large dice? I'd say that's three quarter by three quarter by three quarter, Chef. That's right, good job, good job. Okay, so if we know we're trying to get three quarters of an inch out of this onion, we know we need to make some pretty large cuts, okay? So what you're gonna see me do here is, one, I got a little bit of heel here left, and I do want that off to make sure it can separate, put that into our food refuse. Okay, now I can see the onion. Now, I know by looking at the length of this onion that three quarters of an inch is gonna be about that much. 
So I only need to make one incision right down the middle, okay? Same thing on this side. Remember, I'm going for three quarters of an inch. So I look up top and I find three quarters of an inch on the right side, down and away. And when I move to the left, I want to go that three quarters of an inch all the way across. All right, now on my final cut, thinking about those same dimensions, right? Thinking about three quarters, I want to look along the top, claws in place to protect my hand, and then I'm looking straight down. And the result, nice big, large dice onions, okay? So, we will not be using the large dice onion tomorrow, so we're gonna add this to our stock bin for mirror ball, which I believe is right here. All right, I know we talked about using our, our, our scraps for our veg stock and our chicken stock that are going tomorrow, okay? So what I'm going to do with these last two bits here is I want to keep uniformity in how I cut my, my vegetables, okay? And just really quickly, before I move on to another knife cut, Josh, why is it important for uni to have uniformity in how you cut your vegetables? So everything cooks evenly? Exactly, exactly. Even when you're not using a deliberate knife cut, like large dice, okay, you still want to make sure you're cutting uniformly so that everything cooks evenly. So even on this top, I'm looking across the top, and I'm just trying to get somewhat around a large dice so those cook at the same rate as the other vegetables we're going to put in our stock tomorrow, okay? All right, so we're done with our onions. Those go on to the ice pan, okay? Now, what are the other parts of our mirepoix? Mirepoix, we say mirepoix when we're speaking French and trying to be educated culinarians. What are we saying? So mirepoix is, is, is a blend of aromatics, right? That's flavor to our stocks in our cooking. And, and that, that, that ratio, so we're all aware of it, is two parts onion to one part celery, one part carrot. So what are we going to do with our next is we'll take out our carrot, okay? And we are going to make some really quickly before we do that. Let's go ahead and do a quick sanitize run. We don't have to worry about cross-contamination here. There, aren't, there isn't gonna be any pathogen spread, right, between the vegetables. But what we do wanna make sure of is that we don't have what's called cross-contact, okay? And that simply means that if we, if we wipe down our debris, okay, and we sanitize our cutting, cutting area, then we can be sure that if there's any introduction of someone who can't have one of our ingredients, right? The introduction of a common allergen, we can be sure there was no cross contact between ingredients. Or if someone's allergic, it's not even a common allergy, if someone has you know, a dietary need where they can't have onions, we certainly don't wanna serve them carrots that have been on the same cutting board as the onion. Okay. All right, on to our carrots. Let's grab our, our black sand for our carrots. All right. So, when cutting a carrot, again, we have something that rolls, right? So we want to get to a safe surface as soon as possible. First and foremost, we're going to go ahead and just cut off this end really quickly, okay, and put that into our food refuse. Now, let's see really quickly. Max, what are the dimensions of a batonet? Uh, the dimensions are one-fourth by one-fourth by one-fourth. Of a batonet? So it looks like you may have written that down wrong. So the answer is one fourth by one fourth by two inches, which is no big deal. You, you, you were just simply comparing small dice to bat name, okay? All right, so uh, the first thing we want to do here when creating our blocks is do two inches. So a chef will tell you in the kitchen that we don't carry around rulers, right? We need to learn as a matter of our art to, to know what two inches is. Uh, some cutting boards have it along the bottom. Some chefs put it on the back of their knife. Some get it tattooed on their finger, okay? But the goal is that by eyeball, you can look over the top, see what's approximately two inches, and make your first cut, okay? Same thing here. Okay, 
and scrap. Now in this case, we've already set aside some a mirror plot in, right? And we need keratin for our stock. So we'll move that up front here. And right quick, before we do our bats and angle, we're gonna do is we're just gonna try to get some, some carrots cut here and add that into our mirror plot for tomorrow. Okay? Move that out of the way so everyone can see it. Now, we've got our rolling element again. Okay? So what do we want to do? We want to get our first flat surface. While it's not rolling, sitting up top, we're going to make our first cut down. Okay? And now we have a flat surface to cut the remainder of our sides on it. Cut down, cut down, cut down. Now, this last review is just looking at our block. We've got a little fat into our block here and we want nice, even sticks. So we're going to come back here and just make one quick adjustment right there. And now we have a nice block. Now, these are carrot scraps, okay? We want to get them in roughly the same shape as our large dice. So we're just going to come back here, make a couple quick cuts. And then these can go into our stock tomorrow. Again, thinking about our waste, thinking about how we're using our scraps, right? How are we going to make our mirror plot? How are we going to make use of the ingredients we don't need? We already know that our batonets are going to be for our hummus tomorrow, right? But we don't need to misuse the remainder of the ingredients, right? Respect for the food. Okay, so when we talk about doing knife skills, what we say is block it, plank it, stick it, dice it. Okay, so our next step here is to create planks. Okay, four planks. Okay, and then out of our planks, we want to make our sticks. And now we have nice, four nice batonets. Okay, just want to come back and get these others done. Same thing here. Notice that when I'm cutting, I stay right in my center, right? You don't see me reaching across the cutting board, acting at an angle, leaning down or up, okay? Staying right in the center, so I'm staying right, right in my, my course, all right? All right, here's our Lexan for batonate carrots that we'll use for our hummus tomorrow, okay? Now, we will be throwing these in and steaming them just a little bit, okay? We'll go ahead and do the last cut. scraps the sidewalk. Again, just turning these into some form of larger cuts so we can use them to stop tomorrow. Okay. All right. And now back to our block to do batonet one more time. Okay. And, okay. All right, we have our sticks. So, We've got our batonet and we've got the second part of our mirror plot. Just gonna move our batonet over here. Okay. We're gonna grab one more carrot, cut that end off, put it into our scraps. And for this one, we're just trying to get our ratio right on our mirror plot. Everyone can see we've got about two parts onion there. And so what we wanna do is we wanna come back here and get some, get some large chunks in there. Okay. A little bit more. All right. So we've got our ratio right. Okay. We'll keep our mirror paw on the left there. All right. Last part of our mirror paw, our celery. Really quickly before we move on to a quick cross contact check. Okay. Right. Next step, celery. Okay. Any questions so far about mirepoix, celery, vegetable cuts? No? No, sure. All right. All right. Let's knock out our celery then. All right. So, when you're doing your celery, you're looking at it, right? One thing you want to make sure of is, was it washed properly, right? Can you see visible dirt? Okay. And then, we're only going to need about two ribs of this celery, okay? 
So we'll grab two of these outer ribs, and then this can be put back into the region to be used again by another student, or passed around the class if someone didn't already grab their celery. Okay, so in looking at our celery, well, what do we want to do is we want to cut off this one end, put it into our, our veg scrap, and then just looking across the top, again, trying to get the dimensions of large dice. Okay? So, all right, so when you bring this to the chef station tomorrow, we should see a Lexan that has two parts onion, one part celery, one part carrot for our roasting we're going to be doing tomorrow, or our stocks. We'll probably divide it up within the group a little bit so we use all of it. Okay? All right. I'm going to sanitize after our celery. And then I want to wash my hands before we go on to bell pepper and our basil and our garlic. And I'll definitely be washing my hands after our garlic. All right, be right back. Just need to wash my hands. All right, and we're back from washing our hands. All right, so we've covered most of our skills for today. We just have a couple more things we want to finish for tomorrow's class. A couple things we need to get done. So first and foremost, we have... Okay, our basil, okay? So tomorrow after our cookery, we wanna use some of our basil as a garnish, okay? When visually looking at your basil, just look at it, smell it. Does it smell nice and fragrant? Is it beautiful? When we use fresh herbs in cooking, we're, we're providing that nice, subtle, fresh flavor, right? And just remember, if you're using this in the kitchen and I'm not with you, and you decide to use the dry element, let's say we don't have fresh basil, uh, we always will, but in the event that we don't, Let's just say you're gonna use dried basil. You wanna make, you make sure you use about one third as much of the fresh amount, okay? So what are we gonna do with our basil? We're gonna do what's called a chiffonade, okay? So we're gonna take off some of our leaves here. We wanna get a, a decent stack, so we're gonna go with about five leaves, okay? Put that back into our veg knees. We wanna take our biggest leaf and put it on bottom, and then what we're going to do is we're just going to stack our leaves right on top of one another. All right, throw our littlest one on top, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're just going to roll it over ever so slightly nice and tight. All right, holding it with the cloth, come back with our chef's knife. And this time we want to make sure we're not pushing down, right? We definitely want to be slicing. All right, and as a result, what do we get? Nice, beautiful ribbons of basil that you can use for garnish tomorrow. All right, so let's talk about what we've done so far today and how it applies to tomorrow's class. Okay, go ahead and put our basil on ice tomorrow. All right, since we're in summary, we're going to put our lid on our vegetable ingredients and clear those off of our station. Okay, we're done with these. We can put these back on our storage. And then of course our food and non-food refuge can go right onto our tray. Okay, we'll leave that down below there for now. All right, let's get a quick sanitizing real quick and then we'll summarize. You're probably asking yourself, Chef, if you're the only ones can use this station, why are you so worried about sanitizing it? Because as a, I believe that excellence is a habit, not an act. And what I mean by that is, is that if you do things the same way over and over again, it becomes a lifestyle. Excellence is a way of doing things. Uh, when I got my certification from the ACF, it wasn't just about doing it right one time, it was about doing it right for the rest of my career and showing that I had that skill set. Okay? And so, I want to make sure that every time I leave my station, whether it's for demo, or we're in the kitchen cooking together, or we're at a friends and family event, doing a pop-up, or I'm asked by one of my friends to go cook in one of the restaurants, I want to make sure every time someone comes to one of my stations that I have a nice, clean work area, everything stays organized, and not just organized, but organized in the right fashion, right? So my vegetables are up here, 
my beef in the middle and then my chicken on bottom again, just always practicing proper storage and mise en place. Everything is labeled. If the chef walks up, he doesn't want to disrupt my work, right? He wants to see that I'm nice and organized. He can actually come over, pick up one of and say, oh yeah, I don't have to ask him about his Brunoir jalapeno. He already has it ready to go, okay? So let's summarize today's demo just a little bit. Let's start with chicken fat, okay? So broke down our chicken. We're gonna use two breasts for one grill, one sear tomorrow. You'll deliver those to the past. Remember proper, proper doneness, okay? Max, what is, the, what is the minimum internal temperature for chicken? 165. 165, absolutely correct, okay? Wing flats are gonna be deep fried. We have some wings tomorrow. We'll make some blue cheese to go with it, okay? We're gonna roast our two legs. So we'll take our quarters out. We'll separate the, the leg and the quarter, okay? And then we'll use our legs for roasting. Josh, what, what by definition is roasting? Uh, Chef, it's a dry heat technique in the oven. In exactly the right. right. Exactly right. Good job. Okay. Now, this next one, braising. We're going to braise the two thighs. What are we doing there effectively? We're combining what? What two methods when we braise? Moist heat and dry heat. Moist heat and dry heat, right? It's a combi method. Okay. So we're going to braise those thighs tomorrow. And then finally, we'll take all of our wing tips, all of our bones and scraps, and we'll throw it in and make a nice, delicious batch of chicken stock, which we'll use to make our sauces later in the week for meat cookery, okay? Beef fab, wanna make sure you get three even medallions out of your terrace major, okay? Make sure that you, you portion it in such a way that when you deliver those three medallions to the past, you can do three things. The first one, I should be able to visually look at your beef and want to eat it, right? It should have nice, beautiful caramelization, a nice sear. What is that sear called on me? Josh, my, my, reaction, my art yeah. reaction, absolutely. Okay, I want to see a nice, beautiful sear on the meat. Okay, and then before I ever cut into it, or Chef G, or whoever your, our evaluator is tomorrow, before we cut into that meat, I'm going to ask you to declare your temperature. Okay, I know you can cook proteins. I've seen you do it in class. What I want to make sure of is that you can cook it to the temperature it should be without peaking, without looking in and seeing what you got. Because I can cut into meat recognize what the temperature is and come up and tell the chef, hey chef, I got some medium well beef for you today and I'll be exactly right. But knowing that temperature without cutting into it because that's real service, right? Real world applications. If you're going to be making steak in a restaurant, you will not be cutting into it. I promise you. The expectation of the chef will be that you can cook that steak to the right temperature and put it on the plate without a single cut in it. Okay? Butter basting. Make sure you don't let your butter get too hot. Let it rest in the crook of the pan. Nice, slow, deliberate movements. Nice, foamy butter, right? Get that flavor in there. And then finally, make sure all of our tips are cut up so that we can put them into the grinder. Chef G will show you tomorrow how to use the meat grinder safely, okay? He'll use that leftover carrot here in my, in my, my vegetables to push down the meat, right? Again, just continuing to use ingredients. Maximum use, okay? And then your vegetables. Make sure you get a small dice done for your rice pilaf, okay? Make sure you get a, a good batch of mirepoix for your stocks and for your braising on your chicken thighs, okay? Now, let's say, for example, we know we have some leftover veg here, okay? Now, for the purpose of this demonstration, there's actually vegetables left over here for, for a very specific reason. There'll be times where a recipe has a certain amount where you won't use all of it, but let's say I need to go put this back into the fridge. It's in a container, it has a label, they know when it should be used, but knowing which order food should be used in is super important. Josh, what is FIFO? First in, first out. First yeah. in, first out. It means we always use food in the order which it should be used, right? If you use eggs that came in first before your eggs that came in this morning, you'll sure you're always using your ingredients, right? Eliminate waste through proper rotation. All right, um, I'm just making sure I covered everything that we said we were gonna to cover today before we head into the kitchen. Let's see, we went over, yep. Okay, really quickly, just wanna go over um, knife cuts. Uh, you will have some leftover vegetables. Because we're using them for stock, I wanna make sure they're uniform, but I do want you to practice some more knife skills. One we didn't talk about today. Max, what is a medium dice? Uh, medium dice is Half an inch by half an inch by half an inch. Good job. Okay. Again, if you intend to deliver a knife cut to the past, say, Chef, what I've cut for you today is a medium diced bell pepper or a medium diced onion. Our expectation is that if we hold our ruler up to it, you've gotten really close. 
right? We know vegetables have natural curvatures. We know that you won't make perfect knife cuts every time, but every time it should be really close and really uniform and demonstrate your skill, okay? Tomorrow, full expectation when we're rotating around the kitchen is, I should not see a rack that doesn't look like this one, okay? Everything should be stored in the appropriate spot. I should not see chicken above beef. I should not see chicken above vegetables, right? When you put your finished product in the region, I don't want to see students that are just taking chicken and putting it anywhere they want in the region. Chicken should be on the bottom, right? Proper shortage of ingredients. Proper labeling. If you want to make sure that Shannon, and I'm looking at you, Shannon, that you're not taking Josh's carrots again tomorrow, the only way he can do that is if there's a clearly labeled Lexan that says Shannon's vegetables do not touch. Okay, so make sure you're using proper labeling. Any other questions for me really quickly? Let's just go ahead and, uh, Josh, question for me. Uh, Chef, do you use whole chicken at home? And, I do, I and do. What, what do you use it for? Uh, so for me, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a family of five, okay? So uh, I, I do try to be uh, frugal when it comes to our groceries, mostly because I know how to maximize the use of ingredients. So I'll buy uh, whole fries in a two pack from, from the store. And what I'll do is when I get home, I'll just go ahead and break them down right now. I get the groceries put away, I'll break them down. And on that first day, my, my teenagers get so excited because I'll go ahead that first day and I'll store the chicken breast for my wife who loves to have chicken breast as part of her meal prep. And then I'll take those thighs and wings and everything and make a chicken and dumplings. So I'll take the carcass, make a nice delicious stock, and then I'll take the actual meat, roast it off, and then add it back to that stock, cut up some nice fresh biscuits, toss those in there, free dinner, okay? Max, questions before we close up. Uh, yeah. uh, so I saw those small medallions that you made. Do restaurants use those by chance? So in, in our repetition, we want to make sure you're doing a lot of grilling and searing, right? And understanding those techniques. In the restaurant, in most cases, the medallions might be a little bit larger. But remember, we've made a transition from you know, traditional you know, haute French cuisine to nouvelle cuisine, which basically states, we're gonna make a nice, beautifully arranged plate that has little medallions of beef and, and sauce and, and, and garnishes and colors and shapes and takes and textures, and the plate should just be beautiful. So to answer your question appropriately, you can still go to Logan's or Texas Roadhouse and still get your 16, 18, 20 ounce porterhouse because this is America and we love big portions, right? But in Nouvelle Cuisine and fine dining, preparing you to hone your craft and your art, if you're going to make a beautiful plate, you need to be okay with using smaller portions, okay? Any, any other questions for me? Knife cuts, chicken fat, beef fat, last chance. Uh, how will we be graded tomorrow on our knife cuts? Good question, good question. So uh, as part of your rubric for tomorrow, you'll notice that there are different sections for your chicken, beef, knife cuts, and then of course your finished products and plating, okay? So one portion of your rubric tomorrow can award up to 10 points as part of your final grade for knife cuts. So what are we looking for? I will tell you that the idea when you're coming up to the station is I'm not walking up to film, right? My, my, my stance is from the culinarians code which states I will share my skills with all culinarians, okay? So if I walk up and notice that maybe you were leaning a little bit so there's a little more angle to your cuts or maybe you were going too fast and you weren't being deliberate, and you know your size is off. We're gonna talk about those things, I'm gonna share them with you, and I'll deduct points accordingly, because remember, transparency and honesty, I don't wanna tell you you have a skill set that you don't have, okay? So, building on you every day. So, size, uniformity, and quality. Remember those three things. Is it the right size, okay? Is it uniform across the board? And is it a quality cut, right? So when I look, and I see that you cut apart a vegetable, do I see there was a lot of carrot waste? Did you properly cut off the end and put it in your food refuge? Is there, you know, a lot of misshapens? Is there oddball shapes and stuff like that? Just looking for the quality in your performance is kind of our goal tomorrow. Okay, good, good, good question, Max. Guys, remember, every time you come to the pass, our goal is to build you up, right? We didn't expect you to walk in the first day and deliver us a, you know, a, a five-star Michelin plate, okay? But what we want is for you to come to the pass honestly and say, Chef, this is what I did, and so that we can talk about what you did. Maybe there were things we can correct in your processing. Maybe you deliver something that's both delicious and technically correct, and we get to say, great job, give it another go, okay? But our goal for day one, all the way until the day you graduate, is to build your skill set as culinarians, 
Okay? So if that's it, if I can get everyone to stand up, we'll go do our lineup at the door, and then we will get into the kitchen. Thanks so much.